Live from Earth, it's Space Radio. Hello, Space Cadets. I'm Paul Sutter, astrophysicist at Stony Brook University and the Flatiron Institute. And for the next half hour, your agent to the stars. We have an amazing show today where we have a special guest, Dr. Peter Vischer from the University of Connecticut. This show lives on listener questions. And yes, Dr. Vischer will be answering your questions as well. We record every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern here at Spaceman Studios in New York City. So leave a voicemail at spaceradioshow.com to get your question on the air. You can also follow along live with our space cadets tuning in right now from around the world, including but not limited to Bankersfield, California, Marysville, Washington, Howell, New Jersey, Warsaw, Austin, Texas, Idaho, Washington, D.C., Pell City, Alabama, Turkey, Brasilia, Brazil, and Halifax, England. Well, how about that for all those wonderful space cadets tuning in? Listen, folks, this is so exciting. I'm sh- I am just so pumped for tonight's show because we have a guest which means I don't have to do the majority of the talking for once. And I'm not the one who asked to answer all of your space get at questions. No, someone else is going to do it for me. <laughs> Joining me this week, and please keep those questions coming. I will funnel them along. Thank you to Nancy Graziano for funneling those questions to me so we can get them to my special guest. And we'll talk about the news and stuff uh, after we have extracted Every single bit of useful knowledge from my guest tonight, we are going to wring him dry like a microbial mat. Joining me this week is Dr. Peter Vischer, Professor of Marine Sciences at the University of Connecticut. He is part of a team of researchers who have discovered that the earliest microbial life here on Earth was supported not by oxygen, but rather arsenic. What impact does this have on astronomers as they search for potential biosignatures on exoplanets? We are going to find out. Dr. Vischer earned his PhD in microbiology from the University of Groningen, the Netherlands, not in Connecticut. He was the keynote speaker of Pale Blue Dot 2 and was an original NASA Astrobiology Institute road mapper among 100 scientists who started the Astrobiology Institute. Welcome, Dr. Vischer, to the show. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, this is fantastic. So you are a self-described astrobiologist. Is that correct? That, that is correct, yes, and, and astrobiology is a, is a discipline that merges um, different traditional fields like chemistry, astronomy, biology, and, and addresses questions uh, of what's out there. Ooh, like, like specifically living things that are out there. Living things that are out there, exactly. Uh, yeah, the Astrobiology Institute had three and still has uh, three, three big questions. One is... Uh, uh, how did life start and how did it evolve? Uh, the other one is, is there life out there in the, in the universe? And the third one is, how do we find it? So obviously, actually searching for life outside the earth is going to be a bit of a challenge because you can't exactly go out there and dig it up yourself. So how do you go about being an astrobiologist? Well, in, in the search for life and the origin of life, uh, you go to a planet where we know there is life, and that is planet Earth. So we, we try to, to look at uh, primitive ecosystems, uh, old rocks, uh, lots of chemical evidence, biological evidence is a little bit more difficult when you go in deep time, and you try to make sense of this. It's, it's a puzzle, and the puzzle is never complete. There are always some pieces missing, and you have to fill this in. There's a bit of arm waving going on, but it's a very exciting field because there's a lot of discussion. Right, you're right. Any field with astro in its name is probably going to involve <laughs> yeah. a lot of hand and arm waving uh, to get the results we need. Uh, you mentioned searching for evidence and, and filling in the gaps. So what kind of evidence are we looking for and, and what kind of time ranges are we looking at when you're hunting for ancient life on Earth? So, so there, there are two approaches, and, and one is using uh, different uh, observation techniques of uh, exoplanets, so planets outside the solar system. Uh, that's basically looking at little little light signals and, and interferometry and, and seeing uh, little wiggles and detecting planets that way. And then if you're lucky, you can look at an atmosphere. Uh, within the solar system, of course, uh, we're very lucky that we can go to Mars with, uh, with robots so far, but ultimately maybe also uh, with human missions so that's a little bit 
closer and and we can do a lot of uh, work from uh, from orbiters and what have you so we have a lot of information about the planets closer to us and the further you go out in the solar system the more difficult it is to to get that information but uh, we're doing a pretty good job and that's uh, not only nasa it's also the japanese the chinese and the europeans of course uh, we're all working on this together and the russians we're all working on this together very cool. So, so uh, you're personally not looking up very often. I, I get the sense that you tend to right. look down. Where right. on the Earth are you looking? Right, right. So, so I'm trying to find places uh, where you find very, very old uh, ecosystems, and they are old because we can go to to rocks in certain places like Western Australia, like Greenland, like South Africa, where you can find very old rocks that have not been changed a lot. Uh, they have not been cooked like, uh, like most of the, the crust of the earth is. And there you can see certain features in the rocks. And uh, you can look for uh, analogs of those features in, in modern ecosystems. And typically today, those are found in, in extreme environments. Uh, Bahamas uh, with high uh, flow rates of water, Atacama Desert with high UV, uh, Western Australia with high, high salinity. Those are examples of modern systems that you can study that look very much like what we find in, in the rock record going back billions of years. Very cool. So I have two questions to follow up from that. One is what makes Western Australia, South Africa, these places you go to so special? Why is it we find old rocks there? And then these features that you mentioned, what ex what do these features look like, mm -hmm. and, and how do you know that they are probably biological, biologically mm -hmm. sourced rather than chemically sourced? Right, right. So very, very good questions. Uh, so um, the the plates of the Earth they move around in plate tectonics, and uh, the center of those plates they are relatively inactive with respect to to met metamorphism and and being cooked and the, the edges they dip down and there's a lot of geologic activity that alters the rocks but in the middle the rocks stay pretty much the same uh, they, they go up in temperature a little bit but they are relatively well preserved in time and so the middle of those plates western australia is an example of that greenland and uh, uh, northern canada is another example and south africa is, is another very good example where we find rocks that are over three billion years old and so in those rocks, there are certain, certain patterns. And if you find beautiful uh, laminated patterns that are um, a little bit domal in, in shape uh, with concentric layers, um, we believe that those are made by, my, by, by microorganisms. And, and, these, and we find the similar features uh, in some places on Earth today. Uh, knowing if they're completely biogenic is a very difficult question. Um, we know of the ones that are a little less than 3 billion years old, we have a lot of evidence. But if you go older than that, and, and presumably the oldest uh, rocks, they're called stromatolites, stroma for layer and lithos for rock. So these layered rocks, the oldest ones in the literature go back 3.7 billion years. But that's very, that's very much disputed whether they are, uh, because the, the signatures get weaker and weaker if you go deeper in time. I see. It starts to look a little more and more fuzzy and more and more right. plausibly chemical the old the deeper you go. Right. Uh, so 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 walk us back to Earth uh, three to three and a half billion years ago. Mm. We're standing around. We're looking around. What are we seeing? What are we smelling? What, what what's the view like here? Right, right. Um, so uh, f first the the outside of the earth needs to cool down it's first wickedly hot and little rafts of magma that are floating and sinking and floating and sinking but then at some point everything cools off enough that you can form the first oceans and we have pretty good evidence for that that's the, the very old rocks they're called greenstone belts these greenstone belts uh, you see uh, the the lavas that that are in the spreading zones of the ocean are preserved there so we know that the oceans were around a little over four billion years but then for quite some time, we were pelleted by, uh, by asteroids uh, because Jupiter was wiggling a little bit. And this is called the late heavy bombardment that lasted a couple hundred million years, perhaps. And so if there was life before, that got all wiped out and it started again after that. Um, so the onset of life, the oceans were pretty warm, 70 degrees centigrade, so uh, about 150 uh, Fahrenheit. Um, no oxygen in the atmosphere, lots of CO2, lots and lots of CO2. So um, uh, a lot of greenhouse gases making, making it hot. Uh, the sun was uh, a little fainter than it is today. Uh, there was no oxygen, so, no, so the UV was very high on Earth. And, and the moon had just formed, so there were huge tides on Earth as well. 
Nice. So, so not exactly a, a friendly pr place. <laughs> not, not, not at all. Not at all. Friendly, of course, uh, from a from a human perspective. Uh, the first life that evolved was quite happy there and, and, and capitalized on a lot of chemistry that was possible uh, to, to get energy out of. So, uh, yeah, yeah. And so that, that dovetails into my next question. What were the chemistry pathways available to that ancient life? So, so the, the oceans uh, had a lot of iron in it from volcanic activity and some CO2 and some sulfur and some other things that come out of volcanoes. And so iron has always been believed to be very, very important player in early life and and you can do some iron chemistry in bacteria that happens that uh, that they can get energy out of and energy is always a critical point um, but the evidence in the rock record is not there that they did that so you have to start looking for alternatives and alternatives for the how they could get their energy what they were eating if you want to say it that way uh, hydrogen gas perhaps there was plenty of that around um, and then some some other um, less uh, less obvious uh, characters, and so the one that that uh, we in the end uh, focused on was arsenic. So this is absolutely fascinating. I, I figured that ancient life didn't use oxygen a lot because there wasn't a really a lot of oxygen just hanging around. Right. What were the arsenic abundances like back then, and how did how did these little critters actually use ar arsenic? So, so with that, we we were very lucky that uh, in some rocks from um, uh, Western Australia, my colleagues from France and and I was a little bit involved with that study. Uh, we found these structures that I talked about, these layered rocks, and we found in these layered rocks on a micro scale, we found the presence of arsenic, which tiny, tiny little uh, globules of uh, organic carbon. So life, perhaps, with arsenic. And the iron and the sulfur was away from, from the structure. So we had some evidence that in, in going back in deep time, there was something going on with, with life and arsenic. So that's how we started to look uh, for arsenic as a clue in, in modern environments. But uh, that's not easy to find, especially not in the absence of oxygen. So that's where, where this, this uh, recent work uh, comes in. Is there any present modern day life that is using arsenic in a similar way? That there is, and um, there is um, in in the deep oceans, in some lakes uh, where the the bottom waters never are mixed with the surface waters, uh, like Mono Lake, um, and and in the Atacama Desert, and in the High Andes, actually, there are quite a few lakes where uh, where these processes happen. But none of these environments is absolutely void of, of oxygen. And of course, early Earth, there was no oxygen until 2.3, 2.4 billion years from now. So the first billion years of life, uh, there was no oxygen. And so we were really looking for a long time to find an environment where oxygen would never be present. That's, that's very difficult to find. And once you find it, it's very difficult to prove that. Right, right, right. So early life is using arsenic is it using arsenic in a similar way that life today uses oxygen or is it completely different it is actually uh we think it's actually and of course we don't know what happened uh, three billion years ago but we think looking at the analogs that we found um in the atacama desert that it was very similar so today uh, green plants and trees and and algae in the oceans they they use water and they split the water and make oxygen. And in the process, they get energy from light that they then use to get the CO2 to make organic carbon, to make organic matter. The, the system that we found is doing arsenic, uh, use, is using arsenic for photosynthesis. So instead of water making oxygen, you use one type of arsenic and making another type of arsenic and do your photosynthesis and make your organic stuff, your organic material. And then there are other bacteria that use another type of arsenic that is produced through the photosynthesis and, and breathe that arsenic and get their energy. Like you and I, uh, we just had our bowl of soup and, and we breathe our oxygen and that's how we get our energy. And we make water and CO2 out of that. And these organisms, they breathe arsenic with organic carbon and get their energy out of that. That's absolutely fascinating. Uh, how, if this system really was in place, uh, mm -hmm. you know, three, three and a half billion years ago, why did it go away? Why aren't creature? Why didn't this uh, arsenic process uh, continue in great abundance throughout billions of years? There, there was um, an organism called a cyanobacterium, blue-green algae. They were called, and um, 
They're very abundant in the ocean today, and they are in most microbial mats the, the dominant uh, mat builders. Those organisms, they invented oxygenic photosynthesis. They used to photosynthesize not making oxygen. Then through some biochemical mistakes, some mutation, they started to make oxygen in their photosynthesis. And oxygen in the beginning was incredibly toxic to organisms because it oxidizes stuff. And so all the bacteria that were around were really in trouble because now all of a sudden this toxic compound came around. But that oxygen was started to be used by organisms and you can actually get more energy out of a your metabolism out of your breathing if you use oxygen instead of arsenic or sulfur or something else. So it became more favorable and it developed that way. So in that, you start making arsenic, um, arsenic chemicals that are actually toxic to, to organisms, to, to you and I. Um, the, there is a limit of the amount of oxygen that you can have in your drinking right. water and so on. Otherwise, you get pretty, pretty sick and you get cancer and skin diseases and what have you. Wow. So this is so cool to just, just, just imagine the, these exotic uh, chemical, biochemical processes happening. How does this inform our, our search for life outside the earth? So, so um, one thing, it, it, it makes us think outside the box. You really have to think about alternatives of metabolisms, especially since in most places there is no oxygen. Uh, the atmosphere of Mars, for instance, is one person of one uh, percent of the atmosphere on Earth, and only one point, oh, sorry, zero point two percent or so of that is oxygen. So it's like twenty thousand times less than what we have on our planet. So the use of oxygen there is almost excluded. So you have to look for other things, and then you can start playing on paper. You can make some some predictions, and um, you know iron has been suggested. Hydrogen, methane is on Mars. Um, we don't know if there's arsenic on Mars. Nobody has done very, uh, very careful analyses, but we don't know from uh, chondritic uh, meteorites that there is arsenic uh, present uh, five parts per million or so, not much, but enough, I think, to, to get a, cycling, a cycle of arsenic that can support life going somewhere. This leads directly into one of the questions from the space cadets over on YouTube, uh, Rami Hanano. Uh, Asking about biosignatures for potential forms of life. Could you explain what a biosignature is? And then how do we know what we're looking for? Like, especially there's been all this discussion about the phosphine found in the mm -hmm. atmosphere of Venus. Right. Uh, I'm personally very uh, skeptical that this mm -hmm. really is a biosignature. I'm very curious about your take. Uh, what is a biosignature? How do we know it's a biosignature and not like a, a chemo signature? Right, right, right. So the, the perfect biosignature is you and me, right? If we see a human being, or green or blue or purple, whatever, it would be a biosignature. If it's life, it can, can so, but that's very unlikely that we find that. And since we think that the, the most likely life that can evolve is something microbial, you have to look for a signature of a microbe. Now, microbes don't have bones, so they don't fossilize very well. There are some, some fossils, but they're very, very nebulous if, this, if they are or not. So you have to look at what they do chemically. And uh, so if you find uh, a gas that is uh, changing in concentration over time, um, that you can make sense of, uh, of it could be coupled to a metabolism, that could be a signature. Uh, there are isotopic signatures, there are lipid signatures. So there are different chemicals that you can use um, as, as signatures. And so that phosphine that was discovered on, on Venus uh, not so long ago uh, was presumably uh, a candidate for a biosignature. And uh, phosphine, uh, the will of the wisp uh, in, the, in, the, in the old stories, in the legends, um, where people saw ghosts in the, in the salt marshes and in, in, in uh, cemeteries, that could have been phosphine, phosphine gas. Uh, so bodies are full of, uh, of, uh, of phosphorus. And if that is decomposed uh, under certain conditions without oxygen, that can make phosphine gas. And that, de that, that spontaneously combusts when it uh, gets in contact with oxygen. And that's the, the will of the wisp. So this same stuff was found in, in Venus. And, um, and of course, the conditions there are very extreme. The atmosphere is 100 times thicker, denser than, than Earth. The clouds are sulfuric acid. It's very, very acidic, very reducing. And so not a very good place to live, as we think about it. Uh, but the, the, the fact that this phosphine was found, and not everywhere, that's also a good, good indicator if it's 
in, 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 in uh, discrete areas, it could be a potential biosignature. In the case of, of phosphine on, on, uh, on Venus, I think uh, I would agree with you. Uh, there are chemical pathways, especially under uh, highly acidic and highly reducing, so lacking oxygen conditions, uh, that you can make this in a pure chemical way. And so it's, it's not a strong biosignature. So if you look for life in another place, you don't want one biosignature, two would be better, but really you want three, four or five. And those combined build a stronger case that you actually are, are dealing with something that is a true signature of life. So is ironically, is it ironic perhaps that your research is making the search for life in some sense is easier because it's opening up the potential pathways for life, but also making it harder because if, if the only life, if life only used oxygen ever, then it would be a pretty obvious biosignature. But if there are other chemical pathways mm -hmm. with other byproducts, uh, then when we see some an abundance of some random exotic chemical, it makes it harder to decide if it's from a chemical process or a biogenic process. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is, that is true. And so in the case of the old rocks I was talking about earlier that we found in Western Australia, where we saw not only the arsenic, but we saw also saw the structure that the microorganisms built in way back in time and still do today, but it was the only life for a long time on Earth. Um, so if you see a combination of the fabric, how it looks, as well as the chemical composition, arsenic, uh, even better if you can see arsenic in, in different oxidation states, that means that you can have to cycle different, different uh, types of, of arsenic, that is, then the evidence is stronger. And so, for instance, uh, again, uh, coming back to this very exciting mission uh, to Mars that is uh, under its way, um, uh, Perseverance will land in Jezero Crater, and, which is a floodplain. It was a lake at some point, and, and will actually drive up to the rim. And close to the rim, there are carbonates. And these old rocks that I'm talking about, these tromatolites, these layered rocks, are made of carbonates. And the carbonates are produced by the microorganisms that live in these microbial mats. So if, and this would be just a beautiful thing if this would happen, if, if the uh, perseverance would drive up to these carbonates and they see a pattern of, of beautiful laminations and the pixel instrument that's on the arm of uh, perseverance will shoot its x-rays and find a lot of arsenic in there, then it could say, wow, yeah, this is exactly what we found in the old rocks on earth and what we find in the Atacama desert in these microbial mats. Oh man, so I was pretty down about Mars 2020. I thought it was a just a do-over mission. I wasn't very excited about it. I think I may have had, just had my mind changed. So thank you very much. Uh, are you, are you personally very excited for Mars 2020 and any other solar system missions that you really have your heart and mind set on? No, there, there, there are quite a few actually, and 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 some of the the work that we've done recently is just astounding. Uh, just a few years ago, there was uh, Cassini flew over Enceladus, uh, one of the, the moons way, way out there of Saturn, and uh, it flew over 30 miles over the surface of this small ball, only 300 miles in, in diameter, to pick up some of the small organic molecules that came out of these geysers off the surface there. I think that is wickedly, wickedly exciting. Uh, but I think um, from Mars, we will get a lot of data, of course, because of the rovers there. And we went from on the Sojourner, which was a very primitive thing, to um, Spirit and, and Opportunity. They, they, they were great. They were the Willy Jeeps. They kept going much longer. They were supposed to go three months and one month, 15 years, right? So they were amazing. And then uh, Curiosity was a bit of, uh, now after the Willy Jeeps, we sent the Ferrari up. And uh, it was uh, too many bells and whistles, maybe. And it has not done the great work that was expected. So now we're back to something in between, and we have a, a slightly simpler uh, rover with um, with just seven uh, seven instruments, and one of these instruments is the pixel instrument that is um, uh, doing the lithography. It will look at the composition, the elemental composition of rocks, and that is very similar to an approach that we used in the synchrotron to uh, to find the different elements in our uh, microbial mats that make the carbonates that ultimately can buy, build these stromatolites that hopefully we can use as biosignatures. Oh man. Okay. I am so, officially new instruments. very excited. Yeah. Yep. New instruments, yeah. new missions. We're all set. Uh, I have a couple more questions from the space cadets uh, with the uh, last bit of time remaining. 
uh, we've been talking about the extremes of life, these extremophiles, these very exotic, these almost otherworldly conditions. And I have a question from Edward Hinton over on YouTube asking, is it possible for life to not be based on DNA? And then also, what are the temperature limits of known life? Yeah. Yeah. So um, that goes back to one of those astrobiology questions, uh, where did life come from? How did it evolve? And we know the, about the primordial soup, we know about the Uri Miller experiments, and all the other experiments that made the, the building blocks of life. And then we have the first life, Luca, uh, the last universal common ancestor, a mouthful. Um, and and um, so um, we, we can do reconstructions of that. And, and we know something in, um, about the, 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 the extreme ranges uh, under high pressure, uh, hydrothermal vents, organisms can live at 120 degrees, for instance. They have to turn over the DNA very quickly. But uh, before Luca, Luca was probably the first uh, DNA-based uh, ancestor of ours. There was a, a time that there was probably an RNA world. So RNA molecules are much simpler than DNA molecules. And you can make them very quickly from prebiotic soup. But they are very limited in what they can do. They can self-replicate. They can do very simple biochemical reactions, but very, very limited. So again, evolution just pushes always to the fringes of what is possible and to capitalize on, on more chemistry to get energy. We really needed the more sophisticated system. So from an RNA world, we went to an RNP world. It is a ribonucleoprotein world. So now you have proteins with the RNA to then the next step would be the, a DNA world that we know today. So yes, there are definitely other possibilities, especially if you think of very primitive life with very limited uh, number of biochemical pathways, but who knows, uh, that life may be very successful elsewhere. Depending on the conditions, um, RNA is, is more stable under certain conditions, spe specifically acidic conditions. So if you're on an acidic planet, like Mars probably is, maybe an RNA world is more likely there than a DNA world. Okay, fair enough. Over under, when do you think we are going to find life outside the Earth? Uh, well, well, I hope soon, of course. Um, I think the, in the surface of Mars with uh, perseverance, not likely, because there's just too much radiation, UV, there's no oxygen in the atmosphere, there's no magnetic field on Mars, so at the surface, no. But since we see these puffs of methane, maybe there's at the subsurface uh, methane-producing microbes. So ultimately, what we have to do is go and, and drill in the, in the, um, in the uh, Martian soil and go down maybe 10 meters, maybe 100 meters. But those are environments where it's more likely to find life, I think. And, and I hope that, um, that in, in, before 2050, we are able to do that. There is um, already, uh, there was a, a, a prototype of a little, little drilling rover running around the Atacama Desert three years ago. Crex was its name. And so we're working on, on drilling rovers uh, for future missions. And I think that has a, has a great potential. All right, 2050, you heard it here first, Space Cadets. Uh, one quick question, Dr. Peter Butcher. What got you into astrobiology? Um, maybe pure luck. I, I don't know. I was very interested in um, how, how trace gases in the atmosphere were impacting climate and climate change. That was really what I wanted to do. Then uh, people at NASA knew I was doing this kind of work, and they knew that um, I had identified some small organic molecules. Um, I could link it to life without any questions. And they were involved in climate regulation. And so NASA invited me to be involved in this pale blue dot you, as you mentioned in your introduction, to talk about this and to actually go outside my little box and explore what this could be. Um, in support of uh, looking for life in other planets. And so that's how I, how I got involved in, in astrobiology. And of course, it was a very exciting time. The first planets were found in 1995, 1997, the first rover, the Sojourner was on, running around on, um, on Mars. And that was right when the, the Astrobiology Institute started with a lot of very exciting questions, now not only related to Earth, but also beyond Earth. And that was, I thought, a fabulous opportunity to jump in and, and learn a lot from other scientists in other disciplines like like yours with astrophysicists, ast astronomers, astrochemists. You learn a lot and, and learning every day is, is just a wonderful thing. 
Oh, it absolutely is. Uh, Dr. Vischer, has been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your evening tonight to chat with me. And then also the space guys. I learned a lot. I've been inspired. I'm, I'm officially a fan of the Mars 2020 mission. I hope they find something interesting and I will do my best to stay away from arsenic. Thank you, you again. Do, and <laughs> my pleasure, and thank you for having me. All right, folks, that was Dr. Peter Vischer. We still have a few minutes left here on Space Radio. Uh, oh, man, that that was a really fun discussion, wasn't it, guys? I absolutely loved it. And uh, But you, before you go, before I go, and end the show, you know, I'll answer. I saw some more uh, Space Cadet questions uh, bopping around, so make sure I'll get to that. I have today's cheese... Now, I didn't ask Peter, Dr. Vischer what his favorite cheese was. I should have found out. Um, maybe with my next guest, I'll start asking them what their favorite cheese is. But today's cheese of the week is a Newbridge brand distributed by Gourmet Foods International of Atlanta, Georgia. Why is Atlanta, like, why am I getting cheeses from Atlanta? And why does, like... Vermont, Wisconsin, California, we know where the cheese is being made. Why Why is nothing against the city of Atlanta? But like, why is why is my cheese coming from there? I don't know. Anyway, this is Newbridge brand. We got a horseradish cheddar tonight. That's right. David, you are late to the discussion, but don't worry. It will be archived on YouTube. This will live forever unless I delete it, but I won't because uh, Dr. Fisher was a fantastic guest. Um, yeah, I will enjoy the cheese. Horseradish, horseradish cheddar. I'm smelling it and I'm not getting a strong like horseradish note. I'm just getting like a creamy milk. I'm, I'm a little bit nervous because if you advertise as horseradish cheddar, you better have some serious horseradish yeah, Zach Perry, you should go back and catch the entire interview. Uh, it was absolutely fantastic discussion. Uh huh. Zach, you're not sure? It's not bad. Mm hmm. There is horseradish in here, and it is defined on my ingredient label as literally horseradish flavor. So, who the heck knows? <laughs> That is, it just says, yeah, we put some horseradish flavor in there. Where they get a big bottle of horseradish flavor. It, it, it doesn't have a big kick. Uh, I was hoping it would. It just makes it, it just makes the cheddar just like a little bit more aggressive. Like, it's not exactly happy about being a cheese. You know, it's just, a, it's a little bit punchy. It's a little bit edgy. But it's not bad. I mean, I'll eat this whole brick. Not tonight. I'll take at least two nights. So it's not bad, but horseradish cheddar, it could have upped its game and given me a serious punch. Larry, then this cheese is not for you if you hate horseradish. I'm sorry. It's a reluctant cheese. <laughs> it is a reluctant cheese. Mm hmm. Uh, Space Cadets, it's been so fantastic. Unfortunately, this broadcast is almost done. Uh, thank you for joining me on this voyage of Space Radio. Thank you to Dr. Vischer for joining us tonight for that fa fascinating discussion. I've learned so much. That is my favorite part of having guests on this show is that I get to learn. It's like my own private seminar. How great is that? I don't have to share it with anybody. It's only my questions. It's just, I absolutely love it. Uh, once again, I'm Paul Sutter. This show is brought to you by you. Please go to patreon.com slash PM Sutter to keep this show going, to keep the guests coming, to keep all your questions answered. A uh, thank you so much for to Nancy Graziano for producing today's episode, for uh, arranging for Dr. Vischer to join us, for wrangling the space cadets. Um, just thank you to everyone and thank you space cadets for showing up catch the live stream we do this every thursday at 8 p.m eastern you can go to space show.com for more info we are not going to do a guest next week we're going to go back to our standard format next week it's just gonna be all questions all the time about the latest news like maybe we'll talk about um osiris rex they they booped they booped the asteroid Bennu. They collected a sample. The sample's headed back to Earth. So that was a very successful collection attempt. Can't wait to talk about it more. Listen, you can also follow me on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all the usual. That's at Paul Matt Sutter. 
Thanks again, Space Cadets, for listening. See you next week. And remember, science is for sharing and transmission.